Um, okay, so I, I'm going to throw a, a bombard you with some numbers, so um, have your hard hats on. Um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, we have about 200 people um, uh, headquarters in London, but we um, have offices all around the world, and uh, we crunch all the numbers on transactions uh, and deals, uh, projects in clean energy, and also in other markets like um, gas and water. Um, and uh, we also do very deep analysis on things like wind and solar, biofuels, um, energy smart technologies, and so on. So um, I'm just going to talk, first of all, all about world energy future, uh, then world clean energy present, and then UK clean energy. And uh, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. So what sort of energy future are we going to have? Well, one possibility is um, something like this, which I think is a one of the uh, new electric models, I think, from um, Tesla. Um, but if we don't have that kind of future, if we don't choose that kind of future, we could end up with a future like this, which is roughly what we're doing at the moment, pumping a lot of coal-based um, uh, uh, emissions into the atmosphere. And uh, you can see the effect of that from the stories about carbon dioxide going through the 400 parts per million barrier um, just in the last month, according to um, uh, the US government. Um, another way of looking at it, and, and forgive me if any of you have seen this slide before, but the um, contrast between uh, clean energy and dirty energy is uh, encapsulated by this picture. So uh, we've got, uh, clearly we've got traditional energy on the left, and we've got clean energy on the right. So we've got to try and get from one to the other. Um, and let's have a look about uh, how we're getting on with that. Well, this is the um, forecasted trends for world CO2 emissions from two uh, respected forecasters, International Energy Agency and ExxonMobil. And uh, they're pretty similar, actually. They're, they show emissions rising from just over the uh, 30 billion ton mark um, in 2012 to uh, a peak of around 35 billion tons. But actually, even those forecasts depend very heavily on energy efficiency really kicking in. So if energy efficiency doesn't happen and we don't get um, changes in the mix, then the future will be even bleaker than that. And the BP forecast, which I haven't shown here, but it, it actually shows higher emissions over time. So there's a big challenge out there, and um, you can see the potential damage that the trends could cause. Um, and how, what about world electricity generation? Well, this is the IEA's forecast out to 2035. And um, you can see that um, they're still predicting a lot of coal-fired generation, even in 2035. The good news is that other forms of generation are going to become more important on a relative basis. Um, so, for instance, gas increasing to 23%. Um, then we've got uh, wind uh, coming in at uh, 7%. Uh, solar PV at 2%, some of the other um, renewable energy technologies a smaller amount. Fairly small numbers. This is our own forecast at Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and the one to look at is the second from the right. So that's what we call our new normal scenario. We've, we've looked at three different scenarios for the future, looking at how the electricity mix might uh, evolve. And uh, we are a bit more optimistic than the IEA. So we're saying 9% uh, onshore wind by 2030. Uh, we're saying 2% uh, offshore wind. Um, we're saying different types of PV, about 5%, and little bits of the other technologies, solar thermal and so on. Marine so small that it's kind of invisible. But um, so we're a bit more optimistic. But you might think, looking at that, why are we bothering here? Why are we having this event? Because it's still only going to be. 10% uh, or so of the world electricity um, generation mix. Actually, 30% including um, large hydro. Um, so w so why, why are we all bothering? Well, even that relatively uh, conservative forecast, um, in order to get there, then 73% of the total investment in power generation to 2030 would have to be in renewables. So the money is going to be flowing into renewables to meet those kind of percentage figures. And that's because there's just so much fossil fuel and nuclear capacity already in place that in order to get the percentage generation number up, you need a huge amount of investment in renewables. So chasing the money. 
Um, okay, where are we at the moment then? Um, this is investment in clean energy worldwide, and you can see that um, it rose very, very sharply between 2004 and 2011, roughly by about six times. Um, and then we had a setback in 2012, and that's due to two main things, really. One being policy uncertainty, particularly in Europe and the US, which knocked back um, investment levels. And the other one on, on the positive side is that we had much lower costs for particularly for solar PV technology. So you are um, building just as many megawatts, but it was costing less money. And that, that was true to some extent for onshore wind as well. And this chart just shows uh, what that figure um, of 269 billion is made up of. So you've got everything from venture capital and R&D spending on the left to asset finance of re utility scale projects at 149 billion, uh, small scale projects of 80 billion. And then not included in the new investment figure, you've got M&A of 51 billion. So if any of you in this room are looking to um, sell a business in the next few years, you'll be looking for a slice of that 51 billion, as, as big as possible, I would imagine. Um, now, this is trends by region in terms of investment. And um, the interesting thing here is, um, I don't know whether I've got a pointer on this. I don't think so. But if you look at North America on the le top left, you can see it sort of bounced around a lot. And that's to do with um, uncertainty over the continuation of incentive programs in the US. They've always, they always have been extended in the end, but they've, uh, there's always been a lot of uncertainty, and the numbers have been, been very sort of jagged. And in Europe, you can see a setback in 2012 due to policy uncertainty. Um, Middle East and Africa starting to become important for the first time, particularly South Africa and places like Morocco. Um, but the real sort of upward trend has been Asia and Oceania. So if anybody tells you that UK is the only country investing in, in wind power or solar power, then uh, completely wrong. China is by far the biggest investor in these technologies, and the trend has been rising very, very sharply in Asia and Oceania. Um, and one of the reasons for all this picture is what's been happening on costs. So this is a three-year comparison of levelized costs for different generation technologies. You may not be able to read all of these, but on, on the, towards the bottom of the chart, you've got fossil fuel technologies. At the top, you've got wave and tidal, and in the middle, you've got various other renewable energy technologies. But over a three-year period, coal and gas worldwide, on average, have become more expensive. Uh, onshore wind has become a bit cheaper, minus 5%. And if it was a four-year comparison, it would be a bigger uh, improvement. But if you look at the PV technologies, they've all improved their cost competitiveness by 50% plus um, on a levelized cost basis. So that's enormous. Offshore wind has been going the wrong direction, plus 23% over three years, mainly due to the uh, move to deeper water. OK, UK clean energy. Um, this is the trend in, in dollar investment in UK, small scale projects and asset finance of large scale projects. And uh, it's not too bad. It's kind of averaged around $8 billion a year for the last four years. 2009 was very strong because of the London Array uh, offshore wind project. Uh, the largest in the world was uh, reached financial close that year. Um, so it's a little bit lumpy because of that. But you look at the chart and say, well, it's OK. I think there's an element, though, of policy uncertainty creeping in in the last couple of years um, because the small scale solar has kind of supported the overall figure. Um, but uh, there's certainly people don't really know how electricity market reform is going to work. What the, uh, band, what the uh, uh, strike price for the contracts for different is going to be after 2017. So that's definitely damp dampening investment a bit in, in the last couple of years. But it's not too bad. There's, there's no kind of slump in investment in the UK. Uh, this is a, a lift from our database showing some of the big asset finance deals in the UK. And again, you may not be able to read um, these uh, too well, but there have been a lot of, um, a lot of uh, wind projects, of even a solar project in their Wrexham PV portfolio. I didn't realize that Wrexham was such a sunny place until, until this. But um, there are one or two in, in Scotland uh, on this list as well. And there are also other projects where the actual investment size wasn't disclosed, and we've made an estimate um, of how big it is. But it, it isn't on this particular uh, uh, extraction from our database that I, I've shown. So there is plenty going on. Um, UK has these national renewable energy action plan targets for 2020. Um, and I've picked out four technologies here. So offshore wind, uh, 
we had uh, 1.3 gigawatts in 2011. Uh, in its NREAP target, uh, the government was looking for 13 gigawatts, but it actually raised its sights to 18 gigawatts in the roadmap uh, to 2020. Um, so massive increase there. Onshore wind, it was five gigawatts in 2011. Uh, they scaled back their expectation a bit, but still wanting to get to 13 gigawatts by 2020. Um, biomass and waste, 2.5 gigawatts in 2011, wanting to get to five gigawatts by 2020. Wave and tidal, um, gone the other way though. So there's very little at the moment and they had been looking for 1.3 gigawatts by 2020, and they've now scaled that back to 300 megawatts. So a lot more modest, and as we'll see in a minute, that may still be too modest, still be too um, adventurous. Uh, this shows the onshore wind uh, deployment. These are our forecasts based on actual projects and what's been permitted, what's been announced, what's been financed. And we think that those numbers for the UK deployment of onshore wind that I've just shown you are doable because we should be able to do about one gigawatt per year, um, certainly for the foreseeable future, and we should get to, to those projections from the UK government. Offshore wind, however, slightly different story. This shows um, the market around the world where the, where the action is. So uh, there was very little built in 2011, for instance, but the numbers are ramping up. And if you, if you can make out the colors here, you can see that um, in 2000, 15, uh, Germany will actually be larger than, than the UK in terms of activity in um, offshore wind, and so will China on our forecast. So there's a big surprise for some people. Um, but if you add together all the UK numbers, which are uh, along the bottom there, and again, this is based on real projects and, and where we think they'll get to at particular landmarks, then the UK is not going to get to 18 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2020. It might get to something like 12 or 13 gigawatts. So I think there's an open question about um, how the UK government fills that gap. Um, on biomass, um, this is, uh, again, bottom up, look at all the projects and where we think w they'll get to. And we could get to about seven gigawatts by 2016, with most of that being large co-firing at existing um, coal-fired power stations. Um, this is tidal stream, and some people may have seen this chart yesterday, but uh, we're pretty conservative on our forecast for both tidal and wave. We think that worldwide there'll be about 170 megawatts of tidal stream by 2020, with about half of that in the UK, so that's the good news. Um, but it'll be a lot further behind either where the in industry wanted to be a few years ago or where the government wanted it to be in the last couple of years. And this is even more the case for wave. So we think there'll only be about 75 megawatts of wave worldwide by 2020. And, and it'll all be stacked towards the end of this decade. So there'll be some projects where kind of a device is thrown in the water for a couple of years to see how it performs. But it'll take a long time for the project sizes to be ramped up. So I'd welcome any questions later, but um, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Angus.